Greetings AP Chemistry students. Uh, yesterday we looked at electron configurations and electron configuration notation. Uh, there's a few extra notes I want to point out and then I'm going to introduce you to our two new topics for today. Uh, one of them is something you've certainly never seen before and then the other one is um, something that is going to play a critical role in understanding periodic trends which is what we're going to talk about next week. So first of all, I want to point out that this, this note, the m plus one s orbitals always fill before the previous levels d orbitals. So that's why if you notice when you're doing electron configurations, um, after you fill the 3s and the 3p sublevels, you then go to 4s before you come back and fill the 3d. Um, that's because of this thing called the penetration effect, because if you remember from yesterday, the S orbitals have these layers on them. So it's possible for that electron in a 3S orbital to actually get closer to the nucleus and therefore be lower in energy. You also have the fact that these 3D orbitals are in there with the 3S and 3P. They all kind of overlap. And as you keep packing more and more electrons in there, it becomes... Uh, really difficult to do that without the addition of more protons in the nucleus to help pull everything together. And then also the lanthanides and actinides, they go after lanthanum and actinium, which you already know. Uh, this kind of shows how uh, S orbital can actually get closer to the nucleus with that first little layer, and then that's the node, and then this is the second layer. All right. The, the first big topic for today is photoelectron spectroscopy, which is a spectroscopy technique that provides evidence for the shell model of the atom. In other words, that these electrons are in different energy levels and sublevels, or energy shells and subshells, if you will. And so what they do is they take an atom and they bombard it with photons, and they record how much energy is needed to eject the electrons from the atoms. This is called the binding energy, or how much energy is actually binding the electrons into the atom. And they'll actually do this until they strip every electron off of the atom until you get to basically a bare nucleus with photoelectron spectroscopy. And uh, energy equals Planck's constant times the frequency. So it takes the frequency of the photons, which they can be, they're typically going up into X-ray levels of photons, and so they can calculate the energy using Planck's constant. This is a little equation on your reference tables. We'll talk more about this equation in a, another unit later on when we get into other types of spectroscopy. Now, the other thing to note is when reading a photoelectron spectrum graph, you need to read all of the axis labels and numbers very carefully. And I'll go on and show you what this looks like. Um, I have an Excel spreadsheet that will generate photoelectron spectra. So your y-axis is always the relative number of electrons. And then your x-axis is binding energy. In other words, how much energy it takes to remove them. But the axis is reversed. And it's a logarithmic scale but the numbers increase as you go to the left. So this is a photoelectron spectrum for hydrogen. It only has one electron. This is how much energy it takes to uh, remove it. Look at helium, that's it. If we wanna compare hydrogen and helium on the same graph, well, what just happened here? We have uh, hydrogen and then we have helium. It takes more energy to remove those two electrons from helium than from hydrogen because helium has two protons, which doubles the attractive force based off of Coulomb's law. So it takes more energy to remove the electrons from helium than from hydrogen. If we look at lithium, here you'll notice there are two peaks. Lithium has three electrons. Its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s1. So these relative number of electrons, this would be two electrons and this would be one. You'll notice it takes a lot more energy to remove these two electrons that are closer to the nucleus in the 1s sublevel than these electrons 
in the 2S. As we move to beryllium, the same pattern emerges. And then we hit boron. And the fact that these two peaks are close together, but different means that you are within the same energy level, but you, this is the evidence we have for the existence of sublevels. This will be uh, boron, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. And we can go carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. Neon, there we go. This is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And then we can go to sodium. You'll notice here's our new uh, 3s sublevel. And magnesium, and aluminum, and silicon. This kind of just keeps playing out how you might would expect. Phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. And then we get to potassium. That's there. Now let's compare a couple of things. So this is potassium. There's hydrogen. So you'll notice that that one electron in the 1s sublevel in hydrogen requires this amount of energy to remove, whereas the electrons in the 1s sublevel of potassium require way more energy to remove. That's because these 1s electrons that are closest to the nucleus are experiencing the pull of 19 protons in the nucleus versus hydrogen's one proton. So those additional protons, as you go down the periodic table, the energy required to remove electrons from the first energy level keeps going up and up and up and up and up because there are more and more and more protons pulling those electrons closer and closer and closer and closer and closer into the nucleus. Um, we could also compare potassium is in blue, and then I'll put uh, sodium in pink. And you'll notice that essentially everything, um, everything shifts further to the higher energy side for the 1s electrons and for the 2s and the 2p um, and the 3s, although... You may also notice that the outermost electrons in sodium versus potassium, that valence electron, the electron in the outermost energy level, it's easier to remove that electron from potassium than it is from sodium. And it's easier to remove it from sodium than it is from, let me find, lithium. Not by much there with lithium versus sodium. And lithium versus hydrogen. Um, in this case, it's easier to remove that electron from lithium than it is from hydrogen. Right? Because those electrons are farther away from the nucleus, those outermost electrons. And based on Coulomb's law, as the distance increases, the attractive force and therefore the binding energy for those electrons decreases. If you need to go back and rewatch this whole explanation a second time, feel free to rewind the video, watch it again. Okay. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about is a closely related thing here. Well, hold on a minute. This, this little bit right here, is a little note on the quantum mechanical model, um, which says that you can't really know both the position and momentum of electrons. You don't have to know this formula. Basically, the certainty about the position multiplied by the certainty uncertainty of our the momentum is always greater than Planck's constant divided by 4 pi. Um, so the more you know about its position, the less you know about where it's going. Uh, all you really need to know is that mathematical and computer modeling can approximately solve the quantum mechanical model. I'm not sure how the College Board is ever going to test you on this information. I've never seen a question about this, but it's in the curriculum, so you've seen it. Uh, and the quantum mechanical model solves all the known problems of the shell with the shell model 
of the atom. So now for the other part, effective nuclear charge. Um, Z effective, where Z is, keep in mind, Z is the atomic number or number of protons or essentially nuclear charge, number of protons. But this is the effective nuclear charge experienced by the specific electrons in an atom. So effective nuclear charge, the apparent attractive charge experienced by an electron. And this is affected by something called shielding, which is the reduction of effective nuclear charge on valence electrons by the core electrons or the inner electrons that you have. Um, so for instance, the valence electron in sodium experiences a plus one charge and the valence electrons in calcium experience a plus two charge. So let me kind of show you how this works. So if you consider, uh, let's consider sodium. It is, uh, one S two, two S two, two P six, three S one. Sodium has 11 protons in the nucleus. Now the electrons that are in the 1s energy level in the first energy level experience a plus 11 effective nuclear charge the electrons in the second energy level have these two electrons between them and the nucleus so these two electrons eff effectively cancel out some of the nuclear charge so instead of experiencing a positive 11 well, these electrons are also experiencing two negative one charges. So these experience a plus nine effective nuclear charge. And then this one electron in the outermost energy level, it experiences just a plus one effective nuclear charge. So this 3s electron is experiencing just a plus one nuclear charge, which is why uh, sodium can quite easily lose that electron. Now, instead of talking about calcium, let's just talk about magnesium, so I don't have to completely redraw everything. Uh, magnesium, it has 12 protons. And its electron configuration ends in uh, 3s2. So for magnesium, these electrons experience a plus 12 effective nuclear charge. The electrons in the second energy level experience a plus 10 nuclear charge because they're shielded by the 1s electrons. And then these valence electrons, they have 6, 7, 8, they have 10 electrons between them and the nucleus. So they're experiencing a plus 2 effective nuclear charge. They're experiencing twice the charge. So based off of Coulomb's law, that explains why it is more difficult to remove electrons from magnesium than from sodium. And if we go back to our little spreadsheet here, if we pull up sodium, sodium is in blue, and then we pull up magnesium in pink, you can see that the electrons in magnesium, those valence electrons have a higher binding energy because they're experiencing twice the nuclear charge of a sodium atom, the, the valence electrons in the sodium atom. And as you keep moving across the periodic table, the effective nuclear charge keeps increasing all the way until you get to the noble gases in the last column where they're experiencing a positive eight effective nuclear charge. And that positive eight effective nuclear charge helps us to explain why the noble gases, uh, you can't very easily remove electrons from them, right? Um, it also helps explain a few other things. Let me see if I can put this here and draw this on the board. This might be easier for you to see this way, but if we look, for instance, at 
uh, neon. It's uh, electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and it has 10 protons in the nucleus. Now, these first two electrons experience a plus 10 effective nuclear charge. These experience a plus, sorry, these all experience a plus 8 effective nuclear charge. Now, if neon were to gain an electron and become negative one charged, for instance, then it would have to put its extra electron in a 3s sublevel, so it would be 3s1. Well, the effective nuclear charge experienced by this electron, well, we've got six, seven, eight, we have 10 electrons in between here, so this would experience zero effective nuclear charge which is why uh, neon and the other noble gases can't gain any electrons because there would be no pull from the nucleus to hold that electron in place. It would just kind of fly away. Let's take a look at another example. Let's consider fluorine. We know that fluorine has nine protons and its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. And we know that fluorine always forms the F minus ion. Now, if we look at what's happening, the 1s electrons experience a plus 9 effective nuclear charge, and the 2s electrons experience a plus 7 effective nuclear charge. So that positive 7 charge is going to make it very difficult for fluorine to lose electrons, it's going to take a lot of energy to remove one. But if it gains one, if you add an electron and make it 2p6, they're still experiencing a plus one effective nuclear charge, or plus seven effective nuclear charge. But why doesn't fluorine become F with a negative two charge? When it comes fluorine with a negative two charge, you would have to add another energy level we need to go to the 3s and put that second electron it gains out here. Let's look at the effective nuclear charge out here. We have nine protons, and then we have two, four, ten electrons in between them. So nine protons, but ten negative charges. This experiences a negative one effective nuclear charge, and a negative charge on a negatively charged electron is going to repel it. So this could never happen because that electron would actually be repelled from the electron cloud. So I hope this gives you something to think about. I hope it helps explain a little bit about periodic trends. And we're going to dive into this a, a lot more next week. I'm going to work through a few more examples and demonstrations with you.